Aloha. Good morning, everybody. It's February the 3rd, 2021. It's Wednesday. It's 11 o'clock. It's time for Rediscovering America. I'm your host, Tim Apicella, and the title of today's show is, Is There a Same GOP Party Out There? And I think I'm going to go right to our guests. Uh, I'd like to introduce Jay Fidel, Stephanie Dalton, and Winston Welch. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Tim. Uh -huh. You know, every week it just seems like it's something so, uh, every, you know, every week is just unbelievably uh, packed filled with news articles and, and news stories and things that, you know, 10, 20 years ago would be unbelievable. But here we see them once, once a day and every week, even with Donald Trump out of the office, um, uh, things are still fantastic. So, Jay, where is our, Demi where is our GOP party these days? Is, is, it, is, it, is it changed forever? Will, will the GOP, the, what I call the old guard GOP, will they get their party back or is it forever lost with the kooks, the QAnons, and the conspiracy theorists? You know, I think it's that exact question is, is in the balance right now. We're at a kind of tipping point because, you know, there are many people out there leaving the Republican Party because it's so crazy. Um, and there are others trying to save it, like McConnell is trying to save it. His comment uh, calling Green a loony a couple of days ago, that is an example of him trying to save the Republican Party. He's trying to separate the, the crazies out of the party. Uh, if he succeeds, it will, it will continue, it will survive. If he doesn't succeed, it's going to go downhill into um, you know, some sort of dark abyss, which you know, it could easily do. We are at a tipping point. Yeah. And I guess the question is where Trump fits in all of this. Uh, Trump, I think Trump is trying to make it crazy. It doesn't, doesn't work well, um, but he has apparently given up on his idea of having a Patriot Party, and he's rather trying to hijack the Republican Party. This is ultimately a battle, I think, between McConnell and Trump. How do you like that? Uh, and my feeling is that McConnell will probably win because you know, pursuant to the theory that we all discussed earlier, um, as Trump is out of office and off Twitter, um, and he is, you know, the bad things he has done are being revealed. Um, and that trial next week is, is going to show other bad things, and he's going to lose more support, even if he's, uh, you know, acquitted at the trial. And, uh, and over time, the power is going to slough off him, and he won't have the clout to really build the Patriots or, or, or hijack the Republican Party. And McConnell will. You know, probably cut some kind of deals. I'm not sure with what, with Schumer. And, and we will have a, a, you know, a bilateral system. And that will be um, a good thing. So I, I, I can't say I'm optimistic about this, but I, I see the possibilities out there and they, they seem real in terms of the survival of the Republican Party as a rational party. Well, let's look at one person, the representative, House representative from Georgia, Marjorie Taylor Greene has become the lightning rod and the polarizing figure, one person that's ripping the GOP party in two. Uh, but let's, let's take a look at a couple of things that she, uh, she has stood for and has either said or has uh, supported. One is shoot Pelosi in the head. Two, hang Obama and the first lady. Uh, three, Jewish bankers are sending laser beams from the sky to burn uh, the northern uh, woods of California and the wildfires created by these laser beams. 9-11 uh, never happened. The Parkland shootings never happened. Uh, just to name a few of the crazy things that she has, uh, has you know, sprouted and, and, and talked about. And, um, but yet we only have, really, Mitch McConnell has come out and has spoken and called her loony lies. And uh, she's a cancer in the GOP. But he just said that a day ago. Where was he a long time ago when she first was elected? Um, where was, um, well, Mitch McConnell, excuse me, um, um, uh, Mitt Romney has come out recently, and a few others have come out, but where's Kevin McCarthy? Is his loyalty split between Donald Trump and, and the sanity of the GOP party? What's, what's your opinion about uh, McCarthy? I think, I think he bends over for Trump, and I think he's completely compromised for Trump. He's Trump's best friend right now. And it's a very sad story because he'll never be able to recover his, his reputation. And if he thinks that's going to help him in the next election, he's probably wrong. 
it's a huge mistake, a strategical career mistake that he's made. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I, I also feel that um, the Green is, is actually a, a good friend of the Democrats. What I mean is she's so out, out, out of her mind uh, that people have got to be turning off on the Republicans in general. Um, and, the, and the Democrats win by that. Uh, nobody, nobody in his right mind is going to believe what she's saying. You know, when she first started to speak, you only had anecdotal examples of this kind of craziness. But now when we start putting it together, accumulating all the ridiculous things that she's been saying, I mean, any rational person, not everybody is rational, but every, every rational person uh, would say, this, this is a real kook here. We can't, we can't side with her. So I think she's really destructive for the Republican party. I think she helps the Democrats and she helps. I mean, I, I, I think of course, um, Mitch McConnell has done some terrible, terrible things in the last four years. And he should have cleaned things up a long time ago and been reasonable and care for the country a long time ago. But now, as usual, he's caring for himself and he wants to survive himself as the leader of the Republican Party. And therefore, um, he's, he's going to castigate her and make them distance. And it, it's all predictable. I, I don't think that she is going to have a long term effect. I think she's going to be exercised from all legitimate institutions in the government, such as they are. All righty. Thank you, Jay. Hey, you know, we've had some power outages um, on the island here, and uh, Cynthia, Lee Sinclair, that's normally with us, um, she's ready to come on. So let's take a quick pause and see if we can get Cynthia in. Uh, in the meantime, hey, Winston. Yes, sir. You know, I've been saying that when it comes to facts, they're really irrelevant for the GOP. Uh, we're in a belief realm. When you're in a rough belief, uh, facts really don't matter. They don't count. To what degree has the evangelical party that has been attached to the GO party since really um, the Ronald Reagan days when, um, you know, the moral majority was kind of took an entree into the, the politics of the GOP and it was uh, a nice symbiotic relationship for all these decades. But now it's led to almost the acceptance of these crazy QAnon theories, conspiracy theories, and um, anything goes. Whatever Donald Trump used to say, uh, anything goes. And now what anyone says, as long as it's defense of the, the Trumpers, uh, anything goes. To what degree has the evangelicals um, damaged the GOP party and what can be done about it? Oh, it's, a, it's a big question. And I, I think it's more what has the uh, the reverse question is also true. What has the party done to uh, evangelical Christianity or Christianity in general? And, you know, we have very good folks of, uh, of faith uh, who, are, who are, are Christians who probably rightly feel that their, their religion has become mixed up in this craziness and they didn't sign up for that. Um, there was a, a really good article um, in Vox, I believe, uh, about about how um, Christianity, evangelical Christianity, and um, uh, the, the Republican Party have just sort of become one, and that was uh, I think came out today uh, in an interview with David French, who identifies as a conservative evangelical Christian, and I, I, I thought that was a good article. Other articles, you know, Jay is normally a little more pessimistic than I am, and I'm going to go a little more pessimistic than Jay today. Um, we are in a battle for this. And will Mitch McConnell come out on top? Probably. But there's so many people. I, I, I love the article. Didn't love it. But the one that says the main health crisis facing America after COVID is a mental health crisis. And just the <laughs> fact that we have so many people that we have elected members of Congress who are QAnon supporters or that, that elected a QAnon supporter in this and while she may have clicked some likes and stuff on Facebook and we shouldn't all be held to that you know I, I make sure there's not anything calling for um, uh, elimination of public officials in a, uh, a life way you know I mean we, we may want some people not to be elected but there's a difference between that and what she has been promoting or that that Sandy Hook didn't happen or Park Parkland and all of that it's it's nonsense but there's on the other side, um, you know, The Guardian came out with an article and it says it's long past time to admit the blindingly obvious the Republican Party has been hijacked by fascist 
extremist. It is now a far-right organization in league with neo-Nazis who've made it painfully clear that they want to overthrow democracy and seize power using violence if necessary. Every decision the so-called leaders make at this point defines which side they are on, the United States as we know it or a white supremacist mob. Uh, that was from The Guardian, uh, Richard Wolf, and I, uh, that came out today. Um, I thought Representative Kitzinger, uh, Kinzinger also said uh, he was on a, a call and he said, the reality is this, this is the time to choose. And my goal in launching countryfirst.com is just to say, look, let's take a look at the last four years, how we've come in a bad way, how far we come in a bad way, how backwards looking we are, how much we peddle darkness and division. And that's not the party I ever signed up for. And I think most Republicans didn't sign up for that. So for Jay, I would say, okay, you've got this thing here. Um, you know, Boston Globe has one that says the post-Trump, the GOP's post-Trump pivot isn't happening. Sure, Donald Trump is an insurrectionist, but he's our insurrectionist. So right now we're, we're, we're here, are we going to applaud Liz Cheney, or are we going to applaud um, the QAnon um, lady? And you got Kevin McCarthy this week going down to kiss the ring of, 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 of Donald Trump. He's Speaker of the House. He said this, that the insurrection is Donald Trump's responsibility, and now he's backtracking on that. So I don't know what games Mitch McConnell is playing and where he's going to be in there, but he can't have it both ways. He can't leave Liz Cheney hanging out to dry for three weeks and now decide that she's, um, she's great. So I think regardless of where you are religiously or, or politically, this is really um, the battle that the GOP, it is true, it's the battle for the soul of the for the, the party and and therefore um, in many ways the nation. But at the end of the day, um, they need to make some hard choices here and marginalize people that are um, just crazy and don't share in a vision of America that the vast majority of us do. Okay, thank you. I think that's a good point is the battle of the soul for the party. And I believe that you need a two healthy two party system in this country. And I'd like to see the GOP repair itself and, and not be um, in this position that they find themselves to be in. Absolutely. Cynthia, real quick, um, you know, you've talked about the influence of evangelicals in the GOP party on many, many shows. Does, it, does the GOP finally separate itself from the evangelical vote and do they court the evangelicals uh, moving forward? I think that the Republicans are going to court whomever that they can to get the votes that they need because of their dwindling numbers. Um, so I think that's why they haven't totally separated themselves from Trump. At first they were going to, and then they're like, well, maybe we better not. Because they realized, you know, they'd already lost 30, what was it, 30%? No, 30,000. 30,000. 30, 30, 30, Republicans had already left the party. They can't afford to lose even one more. So do you know that uh, Reverend uh, Graham, Billy Graham's son, right? Franklin Graham, he likened the people who vote, the Republicans who voted for impeachment, right? They, he likened them to Judas Iscariot. The guy, you know, the one who betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Excuse me, Trump is not Jesus and and those Republicans are not anything like Judas Iscariot, and they didn't do it for the money either. They did it for the, the con for their level of conscience, right? And they were supposed to vote by conscience, and they did. Well, let's let's look at that because you know, for 30 years, 40 years since Ronald Reagan, you know, be it on Pat Robinson or or a lot of these, um, you know, the 700 Club or whatever club you want to watch, um, they've been castigating Democrats as evil, that they're the devil incarnate. And so no, 40 years later, it's no wonder that a belief system is taking hold in the GOP party, not, not a rational political system. And so it's not a, any, any surprise to me that we're, we're, we find ourselves where we find ourselves with the, uh, the crazies in the party and, and they seem to be now kind of steamrolling over the old guard. So I go to the question is, does at some point, does someone, you know, the, the old guard say, in order to preserve our party, we're going to have to do something and come up with a set of ideas and policies 
versus crazy belief systems just so we can get votes. That we amend the party and come up with a, a reasonable platform in the future that competes with the democratic platform and we win them on the, on the basis of ideas and policies, not on just voting numbers. Well, can, know, I, can I jump in here for a minute, Tim? Of course. Um, I just want to say that um, it, it goes beyond politics. The country has turned to religion. Uh, the separation of church and state under the First Amendment has seriously deteriorated. I, mean, I became aware of this when uh, George Bush got up there, W got up there at his inauguration and talked about a faith-based faith government. He said, what's going on here? And instructed his attorney general to protect the faith organizations and not to not to enforce the separation of church and state. What's going on here? And and now we find that this is like all over. This is ubiquitous. The evangelicals are only a part of it. The country has turned to religion, and religion over overcomes politics in many ways. And until we get back to separating those things, and I hope Biden's administration can do that, uh, we have a problem. Houston has a problem with. We have a program coming on uh, next week involving an expert on the question of um, terrorism and uh, religion and how religion has created a number of elements of terrorism. Well, this you know, insurrection and all and what's going on in the Republican Party is a kind of terrorism, isn't it? It's destructive of our democracy. And a lot of it comes from religion. Uh, I don't know how we fix that, but I think the fundamental point is not so much where religion is in politics, it's where religion is in our society. Good point. And you know, yet, yet you know, church attendance is way down in this country. That's one of the points I was going to make. And if I, I'd love, is it okay if I answer to? Yes, you? of course. Um, one of the things that has really undermined the, the religious doctrine uh, over these last probably 20 years, maybe, is the individual churches, the non-denominational churches that are popping up everywhere, the so-called um, you know, conservative Christians, uh, evangelicals, they don't answer to anybody. There's no body that sort of oversees, like with the Methodist church, we every year we have to go to all these meetings, we have to set new rules, we have to agree on the rules. Then there's you know the consequences if you don't follow the rules, all that sort of stuff in every major denomination. Now you've got all these individual churches that can do whatever they want. They don't answer to anybody. So they kind of make up the stuff as they go along. They get further and further and further away from the actual teachings of the Bible and get further into their own crazy ideas of what they think it should be. And, and that's where I really think we took a left turn. That's right turn. <laughs> we took a left turn as we came out the door. And that's really where religion, I think, in my mind anyway, took a left turn. Okay, thank you. Hey, Stephanie, um, that's gonna be hard for you because I'm gonna ask you a whole bunch of questions and uh, if you don't remember them, that's okay, just ask me again. But uh, number one, um, does the GOP party, does the House, the GOP members themselves force uh, Representative Green out of her committees, the Education and Labor Committee? That's one question. Two is, what happens with Kevin McCarthy? Does he lose his leadership for following this path of destruction for the GOP party? And I'll let you answer those and then I got another one for you. <laughs> First, I wanna say, interesting, uh, Cynthia's comments, everybody's of course, but um, with Cynthia's comments, remember that the majority of our leadership in this country is Roman Catholic. Okay, so I think your point is very good. So we've got all this going on across the spectrum, the totally independent, like the Republican Party, remember, they have no platform, like all these people you're talking about have no guidance or synods or whatever, you know, their principles are that are guiding them for their the work they do for Christ or whoever. But um, any, anyway, so there's, there is a big issue here on religion. So, um, and it has, and it's covered across the board. <laughs> They're represented uh, in, in ways never like before for the first time ever. So anyway, I, uh, as far as um, uh, Tim, your questions are so good. They're so hard. And um, the only uh, hard to answer to pro prognosticate about, because first of all, I think that this is a 
positive context we're in now, actually, for the first time in a long time, because the 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 uh, Wizard of Oz curtain is back. The curtain is back. The whole Senate and 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 the House too. We see where these people are because they have no guiding principles. They have no framework that they're coming out of. Okay, the Republican people. So. Now they're all kind of like when you push your phone and everybody starts shaking everything, all the apps start shaking. So they're all trying to figure, oh, good, here we are. And so they, they've got so many things in place that they, they built, like all of the gerrymandering that guarantees so many seats across this country. So they've got some stuff on that, that's pretty tight and on hold. And it's going to take a while to, to make that anywhere near act equitable for all of us across the country as far as a representation in the in the house especially well that's one of the things that uh excuse me that uh, president biden wants to reform is the gerrymandering process as part of his election reform package which is yeah, a very but, important package yes it is but the thing is they haven't even finished the census yet and like the post office we had all this kind of screwing around with the census and the shutting it down and the not going long enough and the not being able to get off so if for the first time in a century the the function of the cen census was disrupted so we don't even know we'll find out more about this i think they're supposed to report this end of this month or so about what they've got and how much they got and I'll bet you not enough, not anyway. So, so that's a 10 year thing, right? So that doesn't happen again for another decade. And all the decisions will be based on what they got out of this census. And that's where you know whether there's gerrymandering or not. So, I mean, that's connected to the gerrymandering. I'm hardly any expert on how that all works. But anyway, that is, that is feeding into what's being gerrymandered and how to adjust that. And, uh, and it certainly does need it. So I, I laud Biden, yes, has got the right yeah. ideas as far as I'm concerned. And he's helping to, to, to sort of put the, the ship, you know, the fleet back on course again. Because right now it's all over the Pacific Ocean, boats going in every direction <laughs> and not even in any big majority. And the Democrats- Okay, have been but what is, what is the DOP, do what are they gonna do with their own? Specifically Representative Green. What are they going to do? Are they going to put her, as Mitch McConnell said, put her in the further, oh, excuse me, Carl Rove said, put her in the furthest building away from the House floor? Um, do guess. they do that? Do they, they strip her of her committee work? And do they put a Representative Green in the furthest building away from the House floor? Well, there you go. That's not going to shut her up and it's not going to erase her egregious um, accusations or statements about what's happened in this country. But, um, it would, um, I believe that they might surprise us and start coming around because at some point they're going to get real here that when they do this voting on, on his, on, on the president's uh, impeachment trial, I mean, he's already been impeached. Like, wish they just shut up about all that because he's been impeached while he was in office. That was the first step. This is the trial. It's nothing that doesn't necessarily have to get in the way of that. But my point is, they're going to say, oh, hey, this is going to go on. This is getting written down on the record. The congressional record is about as precious as the Constitution. And I'm in that for all my historical value to the nation. So at some point, I think these people are going to get serious about. And then this could, and, and I bring this back up to this green woman is the first, it's kind of a preview maybe of, hey, this is serious. Do I want yeah. to go down in history as signing up for this idiot? I mean, Good so point. what? What? Yeah. What, what, so I don't know. It's just I don't believe that they're going to turn around and all of their views and all of their ideas are going to go with logic and get all that done. That that's all, as we know, values and norms, and the, all of that has been stripped out of the Senate. And that's one thing we can see in that party. There are no values that we recognize. There, there's no principles guiding them that we all have common understanding and belief in. So they have managed to really unroot themselves. So yeah. some, so I think we're at the beginning of a of a rerouting or turning this fleet around or going sort of in the same direction. Okay, thanks for your, you mentioned the word history or historic. So thank you, Stephanie. Jay, historic moment gonna happen here in a week. Uh, whether, whether the trial 
is going to be for or against Donald Trump, we have an event that will be in the history books for at least 75, 100 years, and that is the storming from our own citizenship, uh, the Capitol. It will, children will be reading about this forever. The question I have for you is, by the trial's end, what transformative uh, lessons will be learned? Will it, will it shape our society? And, and, and remember, go back to the, the, the phrase, eternal vigilance for democracy. Does that start to um, work its way through our society again, that the importance of democracy is paramount and this trial will put that, that, that subject in the spotlight? Yeah, and the other quote that comes to mind is, uh, public confidence is the firmest pillar of, of justice. Um, and if, if he is uh, acquitted, which I'm afraid to tell you, my, my guess is, I'd be, I'd be interested in how everybody else feels, but my guess is that he will be acquitted because that's the way it sets up. I wouldn't rule out the possibility of a conviction only because we're a week away. And, and as we have seen, things could turn upside down in a week, any time in this, in this crazy world. Mm -hmm. But the likelihood is he will be uh, acquitted and the Republicans will look terrible over it because, you know, when you take both of these uh, impeachment proceedings, in, in, each, in each case, they didn't give the impeachment managers, uh, you know, half a chance. However, in the course of this trial next Wednesday and thereafter, I don't know how long it's going to last, you know, uh, Nancy Pelosi and, uh, and, well, and Biden want it to last very quick. But, but in the course of this trial, we're going to see evidence come out that is going to be remarkable. It reminds me of the thing yesterday with, um, what's his name, Sicknick, the fellow who died in the, in the um, insurrection, the, the Capitol Police officer. Um, boy, they really put a lot of time and effort into that proceeding. And uh, Joe Biden himself and his wife visited and it was uh, really heavyweight. And I understood they were going to try to do another proceeding, another event about that this morning. And then why is that important? It's because the world is watching. It's, you can hardly avoid it on television. Assuming well, actually, Jay, I hate to interrupt, but Fox did not mention it. They did not report on it yesterday. It, that's disgusting. That's, 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 disgusting. that's predictable. So my, my point, though, is that you, know, you have these events that, that stress what happened. You have these events that replay the insurrection, that try to make sense of it. And at that trial, there's gonna be a lot of you know, data that comes out. It's gonna be all those thousands of uh, phone movie clips and, and uh, uh, comments by people who were there or who had friends there. And um, it, you know, it's, we're gonna hear all of it at that trial and it's going to accentuate what happened. And so what you get is this weird Alice in Wonderland kind of thing where they, 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 they come in with all this evidence, it's undeniable. And then you parse out the language of Trump's uh, in, inciting remarks uh, nearby. <clears throat> and you can only come to one human logical conclusion that he incited. And then the Republicans all vote against uh, conviction. This is kind of remarkable. And it goes to what I was saying before. It goes to public confidence. You know, what, what kind of an individual sees all that evidence, then sees an acquittal and manages to, you know, still support the government in general? Because of those clowns in Washington that can't seem to get anything done, including the COVID Relief Act. You know, what kind of a government do we have? How can we be confident in this at all? I also wanted to mention, since I, I have the floor for a moment, uh, what, I, what, I, what I have been thinking in the last few days, that is Trump's big defense Okay, is that I mean, depending on what lawyers he has, Trump's big defense is that this this whole thing is unconstitutional because he he wasn't president. He isn't president at the time of the impeachment trial, which is a ridiculous argument because a I think there is precedent for that, and b that means if you if you hand, if you if you take that seriously, it means that if a president can do the most god awful things in the last days of his administration uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, defer with McConnell's help, defer the trial until afterward and, and fully get away with it. But here's my point. On the one hand, he says it's unconstitutional because it's too late because he's no longer the president. But his other argument is, I am still the president. Uh, so which one is it? Those two are mutually exclusive. 
Uh, how is this possible? Well, I, I, I was being rather flippant last night when uh, the question came through, and I really do go to, to Rene Descartes, and that is, I think, therefore I am. And in Donald Trump's world, he thinks anything, and therefore he is all these things. So that's a psychopathy that we've talked about. So trying to make rational sense of, of the, the defense for this trial, there is no defense and there's no rationale to it. But now, I, can I just say this? I, I always think, you know, like Nancy Pelosi, not certainly at that level and dignity and everything, but it's about the children. Imagine all of our high school students in this, all our adolescents, they see these jerky people running in and clobbering the Capitol with sticks and stones and probably guns and nothing happens. So how is it that we can even discipline a, a, in our families with our children if the government is not willing to give any consequences and who are these people who've never had con obviously they don't have jobs they were all there on a wednesday getting there on a tuesday and going home on a thursday well, they don't, and a lot of them were military but who knows if they were coming out on a good conduct discharge or not you don't ever know that when you see uh, a military person just because they've got those camouflages right. on doesn't mean, you know, they've served the country with honor and the dignity all the way. Well, we were not same situation, but we had similar situations for, for a year and a half, two years, three years in 1968. Um, the same could be said about what about the kids watching all that on TV? And I was one of them. Um, okay, thank well, you, Stephanie. Yeah, I mean, the, there's no punishment for anything for these people. Right. They can have jobs that they they can go without working. They can go, go serve and not, you know. Anyway, that that's my point. There's okay. no consequence. Thank you, Stephanie. We're almost out. In fact, we are out of time. But hey, Winston, I want to get to you on one point here, and that is, uh, assuming Jay's right that there is an acquittal, the trial. Um, is there anything positive that comes out from the uh, the evidence about what occurred, who was behind it, and uh, connect the dots? Is there anything that positive that comes out of uh, next week. It's a mess. I think Lindsey Graham is right. He says, oh, be careful what you wish for. Well, they're going to bring out the, all the mud they can, and then they're going to realize that this is just a lot. It's a lot of people who are doing this. And it says, Kathleen Parker, I just want to throw a couple things. For those of you like Jay who believe the Republicans can be salvaged, there's an excellent article in National Review, nonetheless, called um, Restoring the Conservative Conscience, and it's on from January 21st. That was a very good article. Um, in, uh, in NBC News says GOP senators at Trump impeachment trial are dooming the party. They need to repudiate him. And Washington Post, Kathleen Parker on the 29th had an, a wonderful article that says the GOP isn't doomed, it's dead. Uh, she just says there's no way that they can go along with this anymore. Um, if you're if you're not voting against this, you're associated with a colleague, the, the Green, that uh, calls for the speaker's murder, promotes QAnon, that Trump was leading a war against Satan worshiping pedophiles and cannibals, um, and he says, "You Republicans, you own all this. Your party isn't doomed; it's dead. The chance to move away from Trumpism towards a more respectful, civilized approach to governance." that acknowledges realities of a diverse nation and that doesn't have to surrender to the clenched fist has slipped away. What comes next is anyone's guest, but anyone who doesn't speak out against myth and lies of fringe groups, domestic terrorists and, demog uh, terrorists and demagogues such as Trump deserves only defeat and link the exile and infamy. Good riddance. We'll see what happens this week. Yeah, we'll see so what much happens. coming out. I, 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 like I, I have hope for the GOP. I think, again, we need a, a healthy two-party system. I used to be in the GOP. Um, and someday it will come back strong and healthy. I don't know but, when. So we have run out of time. We get the information <laughs> out if the Fox is not presenting anything. These went, these people writing these illustrative and illuminated and intelligent articles, they are not being read by these people. And, and if they're- Well, that's another show, Stephanie, and that is the media and the message. And right <laughs> now that's gotta be fixed. Uh, a disaster, which, yeah. They're not I mean, I, I really don't think we progressed and move forward until the media and the message uh, is repaired. And that goes to the FCC, which that's a whole nother show. So we'll have to tackle that later. All right. I want to say thank you to everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, a great discussion. And I love 
the fact that we get together once a week and we have such great minds here and great opinions and I thank you one and all. So Jay Fidel, Winston Welch, Stephanie Dalton, Cynthia Lee Sinclair, thank you for joining us on the Rediscovering America. We'll see you Wednesday, 11 o'clock next week. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. Aloha.